This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That is Romans 10, 9 through 10. So guys, I've got two big announcements today, but before we get to those, I'm back. Sort like sort of kinda like I know I did a I'm back episode a little while back, but I think I'm back back now. Um, for those of you that are new to the show, I know we've gotten a bunch of new listeners here recently. Um, I had two vocal cord surgeries this year. First one was unsuccessful. Second one, we were hopeful. It looks like things have gone well on the the hardware portion of my recovery, and it's just been software work for the last several months, just trying to rebuild my voice, relearn how to talk, to to phonate, to vocalize, to do all those different things. And shout out to Peter Keats uh, with OU here in Oklahoma. He was, you know, 20 year opera singer and, you know, performer and understands vocal performance, but he's also a speech language pathologist and we think we've gotten ourselves to a position where I can safely come back and do solo episodes because for the last couple of months I've done you know forging tables where I can just talk for a second and then there's three other guys or I can do an interview where it's me asking a question for a minute or two and then them talking for three or four or five or ten minutes whatever so I can get a lot of rest but where I'm at right now is way better than back on episode 468. So that was an episode called What If God Doesn't Heal Me? And that was recorded right before my second surgery. And to be honest, my wife and I were having discussions about, you know, what does life look like if I lose complete control of my voice or if at the very least I can't perform vocally via a podcast or on a stage or something like that. And it's like, you know, what jobs are there where you don't have to talk like police officer? Oh, crap. You have to talk. Uh, UPS driver. Crap. You probably have to talk. And so um, we feel like we're in a good spot right now. But I just want to take a quick second here at the beginning to just thank you for the messages. Thank you for the prayers. We still have a long road to hoe here. I mean, I've just gotten to a pretty good spot here. It seems like something has clicked even in the last few days. So I'm recording this uh, about a week before it comes out. But even in just the last few days, uh, I've, I've seen some some good things. So this is definitely an answer to prayer. God is good, but even if he didn't, didn't heal me, and I talked about this on episode 468, even if there wasn't healing and things didn't work out, I'm going to praise him all the more, and I'm going to be there just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. And I also wanted to take a quick second to thank the donors because again I, I explained this on that episode and I'll explain it again here we went from three episodes a week to two well we get revenue whenever we have advertisements on our podcast and when you cut the podcast offering from three to two that's a huge chunk of our revenue and so to the donors out there that have kept us afloat Thank you so much for being monthly donors. Thank you so much for being one time, you know, random donors. It's been super, super helpful for us. But I do want to get some momentum going with this show again. So, guys, again, there are a lot of new listeners to the show. Share this episode around with your friends. Let's get that momentum going. Don't just share the show, share an individual episode. Say, hey, John, hey, Tim, hey, Bob. This is why I'm sending you this episode. I think it'd be great for you. And if you're doing that and you haven't left a five-star review you yet, go ahead and do that as well. But let's go and get into a two big announcements because we've got a lot of content we need to cover today. So I kind of teased this on Instagram last week. This is big announcement number one. We have a new product in the Undaunted Life store, and that is cigars. Yes, we have made our own custom cigars, Undaunted Life cigars. And so... We partnered with Cigars.com. That's Cigars with an S at the beginning. They've worked with Folds of Honor. They've worked with other organizations. And we developed a medium body Toro cigar. I tried them during the sample process. And then they sent me the first box of them. And I, I tried them. And they're just, they're simply amazing. They've got a long, even burn. And I was smoking it with a guy that's like a three or four cigar a day guy. He smoked thousands of cigars. And he was very, very impressed with it. We're going to be selling these in singles three packs and the boxes, which are of 20 cigars. But here's the thing. This leads into the second announcement. Even if you're not a cigar person, right? I would highly suggest that you purchase these because they aren't just awesome for your own consumption, which they are. They're not just an amazing gift for, you know, the great people in your life, which they are. The profits for these cigars are going to an amazing, amazing organization and cause. So this is big announcement number two. Undaunted Life has partnered with the rescue team at the Tim Tebow Foundation, okay? So the rescue team is what the Tim Tebow Foundation does for anti-human trafficking and child exploitation, okay? So anti those things, obviously. And here are some of the key things about what this team does. They do prevention, 
So that's the first thing. They're dedicated to ending the cycle before it begins through prevention with education, training, and new policies. And they do that with law enforcement on the ground all over the world. The next thing is rescue. This team is actively responding to this crisis by partnering with those that are able to execute physical rescue missions and those providing for the immediate needs of of the survivors when they are rescued. Okay, so they are getting kinetic. But then there's also survivor care. Okay, so this group is deeply committed to supporting survivors long term recovery, Okay, because they need communities of care. They need tools for, you know, physical, mental and emotional, social and and spiritual healing because of the trauma that they've gone through. And so we're empowering their liberation from that cycle of trauma and so that they can find new life in freedom. And this is all done through a Christian worldview and with a gospel centered lens. So this group currently has operations in 30 plus countries, and this includes includes five safe homes and they're partnering in 13 more as we speak. There's, you know, 15 additional homes that are in the progress uh, of or that are progressing towards supporting survivors and healing them as they transition back into a life where they actually have freedom. And so basically, let me tell you how this works. For every cigar sold, money is going directly to fighting the trafficking and sexual ep- exploitation of children. And when I say directly, I talked to Steve, who is the president of the Tim Tebow Foundation, and he assured me that all the money that goes into their coffers and specifically from Undaunted Life going in to support the rescue team under the Tim Tebow Foundation, that there is no overhead taking out of that. OK, so they're not taking a percentage for pizza parties and first class, you know, business class seats on planes and things like that. All the salaries for the people that work at the Tim Tebow Foundation are paid for already from different funds, okay? So these are paid for by private donors and Tim Tebow himself. And so when you buy a cigar, when you buy a box of cigars, when you gift them to somebody, that money is going directly to this team that is preventing and rescuing and caring for those that are being trafficked, okay? And so at a later date, I'll be able to tell you the exact numbers of how that all breaks down, so be on the lookout for that. But the link will be in the bio to this episode, and so it'll be a link on my website, which will direct you to the Cigars website, or you can go to cigars.com on your own. Again, that's S-I-G-A-R-S.com, so cigars with an S at the beginning, or you can go through the Undaunted Life shop. That will be in the show notes. So, I've not been able to do quick hitters in a while, so I'm very, very excited to do quick hitters. And I just got to tell you, it pained me to no end to not be able to comment on some of the things that we've seen basically since the, the first quarter of this year because I keep a running note on my phone and I just had just pages and pages of things that I wanted to talk about. But in order to get momentum moving forward and to not look backward, I did something that literally, again, brought me physical pain. I cleared out my quick hitters note on my phone. I just <laughs> just deleted all this stuff and I just started fresh from a couple of weeks ago. So on today's episode on the quick hitters, we are going to cover former President Donald Trump being arrested and his mugshot. Also, Dennis Prager's claim that one form of child pornography is morally acceptable. Also, the resurgence of COVID and mask mandates, the recent racially motivated shooting in Jacksonville, Florida, and the passing of Bob Barker. But before we get there, if you're anything like me, you don't like paying for stuff that you think you're capable of doing yourself. So a lot of people end up doing that with their IT at their businesses. And the problem is that if you're not an expert at it, which I'm obviously not, you can leave yourself open to attack. So I literally just heard today, as of the recording of this episode, a story about a company that DIY'd their servers and data security and they got hacked. Okay, so they had all their important files stolen and they ended up having to pay the hackers $15,000 $15,000 in ransom money to get their files back. I mean, 15 grand just to be able to run their business, okay? Now, I don't want this to happen to the business owners that are in my audience, and that's why I want to introduce you to my friends at LMS Tech. So LMS Tech is an IT security company that can help your business and all kinds of businesses like yours with IT headaches. So this can be network install, configuration, security, and monitoring. It can be server setup and maintenance cloud data and storage, email management and security, antivirus management. And then there's like industry specific compliance like HIPAA and financial services, insurance, credit cards, all that kind of stuff. And they can even set up custom software implementation like CRM and HR tools. So while you guys focus on making your business successful, 
let LMS Tech secure IT. So I actually trust LMS Tech with the security for my business here for Undaunted Life. So I think you should give them a shot as well. So to receive your free IT and data security assessment, visit this website, getsecurity.tech. That's getsecurity.tech. Do not risk your data ending up in the wrong hands. Invite the experts in to protect your business. Again, the site is getsecurity.tech. That's getsecurity.tech to get your free assessment, and that will be in the show notes as well. So I want to transition to talking about this uh, subject matter, and I'll just got to be honest with you from the very beginning here. As I pop into Lajans, you know, got to got to make sure we keep everything good to go, as this is my first time back. So if you hear that clinking around on my teeth, I apologize. I will be taking breaks to have water as well. I had this idea kicking around in my head for a long time, even, you know, before my first surgery. And because of the surgery and recovery, I finally had the time to devote to just thinking this through a little bit more because you know how it goes. You get this idea, it kind of clinks around in your head, but there's not a whole lot there. You don't have a lot of time to kind of really think it through. So I've really, really been thinking it through. And part of this and part of the reason why I've been thinking about this so much is because country music in a lot of ways has dominated the news cycle this summer. Did you guys realize that? Because let's go through some of the reasons why in April and May of this year, or it was April or May, I can't remember which, the biggest act in country music, at least at that moment, at least right now, more on that in a minute, was Morgan Wallen, okay? So he had just released his new like double album in March called One Thing at a Time. It was a mega hit, chart type, chart topper, the whole nine yards. I personally like Morgan Wallen. I think he, he has a very unique voice. Uh, some of the songs can be a little bit formulaic, but I really, really enjoy them. I, I think he's a very talented guy. But I remember seeing on social media that he had to cancel a show last minute and they were doing it, I think at the old miss campus and you know, the crowd's freaking out and here they are, they got all, you know, liquored up and showed up at this, at this concert. And then they don't get to have a concert. And they're really mad about that. But it was announced shortly thereafter that he had to go on six weeks of vocal rest because he had basically done potentially uh, forever damage to his vocal cords, irreparable, uh, you know, pro problems to his vocal cords. And this was huge news Right. Because when, you know, when a country singer, that's the biggest thing in music at the time has to basically turn off his voice just to see if it'll turn back on. Like that's, that's a pretty big fear, uh, altogether. And, you know, obviously I can relate to that from the stuff I talked about from the very jump. So that was a big, big story. And luckily for him, you know, he's working with these great people at uh, a university in Nashville. I think it was Vanderbilt uh, in Nashville. And that's one of the best, you know, throat and speech and singing clinics in the world. And so it looks like he's going to be able to continue his career. So that was big news. Then was the, there was all this kerfuffle with, you know, Jason Aldean releasing the song called Try That in a Small Town. Right. And the thing is, is if you're a normal person with a functioning brain, you should listen to that song, especially if you grew up in the country and be like, yeah, that all makes sense. Like all this crap that happens in these big cities, you know, throwing bricks through windows and destroying businesses and, you know, fighting the cops and all that. Try that in a small town and it's just not going to work out for you. Now, a bunch of people reacted to the song and the video and they, you know, there's wailing and gnashing of teeth and, oh, this is a racist anthem and this is Christian nationalism and this is whatever. And, oh, isn't that the, the place where a lynching happened in that one clip in that video? It was basically a bunch of nonsense, but that did dominate the news cycle for a couple of weeks. But then probably... I don't think I'm being hyperbolic saying this, probably the overall most viral thing to happen in 2023 so far, other than Trump's mugshot, which we'll talk about later, is Oliver Anthony exploding to prominence. So at this point, I feel like his story has been done. If I say Oliver Anthony and you don't know who I'm talking about, you literally have been living under a rock. So I don't really feel like I need to explain to you who he is at this point, but I do want to go through the timeline here. So when the sun came up on Tuesday... August the 8th of this year, a couple days after my birthday, no one on the planet had heard of Oliver Anthony, unless they were related to him or, you know, worked with him or something like that. No one knew this guy existed. But also on Tuesday, August the 8th, Oliver Anthony, whose real name is Christopher Anthony Lunsford, he uploaded a song to the Radio WV YouTube channel, and the song was called Richmond North of Richmond. Okay. Within 24 hours, 
the song was making the rounds on Twitter and TikTok, and I was you know scrolling TikTok, and that's where I saw it. But I basically ignored it because you know I'm like anybody else. If I only have a few t- a few you know minutes to kind of scroll through and see if I can find some interesting content to share with you guys, if it's a longer video, I was like ah, I don't really know, and you know there wasn't something that gripped me from the very beginning, so I basically ignored it. But that being able to ignore a thing lasted basically a few hours because like a few hours later, this is not just here and there on Twitter and, and TikTok and the news cycle. It's everywhere. This song had gone more viral than any song that I'd ever heard of. You know, when you see these pop artists come out and do like these satanic rituals in their music videos and oh, they're going viral for, you know, WAP, whatever that song is by whatever that that gal is like those things didn't go as viral as quickly as this song. There was something about it. Within 48 hours of that song being uploaded to this small, relatively obscure YouTube channel, it had millions of views on YouTube and on social media. Because that's the thing is people just look at YouTube views, but there's this cumulative effect of people watching that same video on Twitter or sharing it on Facebook or on TikTok or something like that. Also within 48 hours, it became the number one overall song on iTunes the number one song on iTunes in 48 hours. Then on Saturday, August the 12th, Joe Rogan shared the video of the song on his Instagram page. And from that point forward, it was to the moon, right? This is the guy with the biggest microphone on the planet. One of the most famous people in existence right now, sharing this, basically directing his followers to it. And from that point forward, there was, there was no way he was going to be able to be hidden under a basket. You know what I mean? That same weekend, Oliver Anthony played a show somewhere, I think it was in West Virginia, and that like a like a month prior to that, he played a show, I think he said in front of like 12 people at that venue. But fast forward to that week that the song released, there were thousands of people there to watch him perform live. And before he started his show, he opened up the Bible and he read from the book of Psalms, I believe. And that was kind of an interesting thing. It's like, this is the first time he had spoken publicly since he had gone not just viral, but mega super duper viral. And he reads the Bible, which was interesting. Now, by that time, not only did he have the number one song on iTunes, pretty much every song that he had ever uploaded to iTunes, which I think was five or six songs, they were all in the top 10. So it was like him, Morgan Wallen, and like Taylor Swift. That was the entire top 10 for for iTunes, but he had the top spot and several other spots. Then, just keeps going. On August the 21st, Billboard released their Hot 100 list, which they do every week and they've done for decades. Now, Billboard is the main arbiter of musical impact. So if, if you top the charts on iTunes, that still isn't as important as topping Billboard, right? And up to this past week, no one, in the history of Billboard had ever debuted at number one on the charts without having previously shown up on the chart at some other position other than number one. So there are people that will have a, you know, a debut album that maybe will go there, but like they've charted somewhere else on the charts. That was until Richmond, North of Richmond. He literally debuted his debut to the chart in total. He debuted at number one. I mean, guys, the Billboard Hot 100 chart has been around since August of 1958. That's 65 years ago this month. And he just blew the top off from the very, very start. Then fast forward to August the 23rd in Milwaukee. That's the first Republican primary debate. They show his video before they ask the very first question of the candidates. Then fast forward to last week on Wednesday, August the 30th, he went on Joe Rogan Experience. And the night before, they brought him up at Joe Rogan's Comedy Club, kind of a surprise little concert that they did. And, you know, I'm not going to go into too much there on the particular episode that he had with the Joe Rogan experience. It was a fun, fun episode. He did open the Bible and read to uh, to Joe Rogan. He read from Proverbs and he detailed, you know, how he gave his life to God here recently. You know, it sounded like a guy that's very young in his faith. You know, a lot of people that are, the you know, Theo bros and, you know, Bible nerds and all that, they're going to quibble with just about everything that he said that had any anything to do with a Judeo-Christian ethic or a biblical theology at all. But this is just kind of a, a, a young guy, a young Christian that's trying to just, you know, figure it out, right? But uh, yeah, again, you should go and check out that interview. And he talked about how he's gotten multiple offers. Uh, he's being dissected in the media. You know, people are trying to get him to sign these, you know, seven and eight figure deals. Oh, we'll send you on the road. We'll send you with a bunch of trailers. We'll get you a backup band. And he's basically like, yeah, I'm not going to do any of that. 
Like, I just want to make music. I just want to write, you know, Richmond, North of Richmond isn't even my favorite song that I've written. And he's just kind of doing things his own way. And with all that in mind, just a reminder, when the sun came up on Tuesday, August the 8th, remember, no one knew who Oliver Anthony was. They didn't know he was a thing. And within a few days, he went viral. <clears throat> he was the dominant topic in all of music and all of entertainment, frankly. And he still dominated those discussions even until this day. There's new reaction videos popping up on YouTube to this song literally every day. And as of the recording of this podcast, let me actually go to go to YouTube real quick. Let me actually look and see how many views this thing has on YouTube as of I'm recording on this on September the 1st. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, 52 million. The video has 52 million views in three weeks. And if I can go there quickly, I'll see if I can look up it on iTunes. Uh, let's see what we got on iTunes. And I don't like dead air, so I'm just going to like talk my way through it. iTunes store. You know what? This is probably going to be too hard. What am I doing? You know what? Let's just assume it's still number one, okay? Because I apparently don't know how my phone works. So just an amazing, amazing few weeks for this guy. Um, you know, it's just an, an incredible thing. And, and I'm not going to go into a big breakdown of the song uh, because that's been done. And it's been done to death. And I don't think anyone can do it better than John Cooper did on his show last week. So I'll just link to that in the show notes on Cooper stuff because he broke down Richmond North of Richmond. So to get back to my point for what we're talking about today, between Morgan Wallen, Jason Aldean, and Oliver Anthony, outside of like direct political stories or the war in Ukraine or any of this type of stuff, that I think that it's reasonable to say that country music has dominated the news cycle for the summer of 2023. Now, let's talk a little bit more about country music. So I grew up in southwest Oklahoma, but I grew up in a very interesting town, Lawton, Oklahoma, where it was kind of equal parts, you know, country and redneck and kind of like gangster. Like, you know, we, we had, we had a gang problem, but then, you know, you might have a cow that would run down the street, like in the middle of the day. Like it was just kind of an interesting, you know, city to be in. And I grew up just absolutely hating country music, hating country music because my parents played it a little bit. And, you know, so I would listen to some stuff here or there, but I didn't really enjoy it because I, you know, developed a, a kind of a liking and an attraction to heavy music, basically from a very, very young age. I think I was 13 when I was introduced to Living Sacrifice and Society's Finest and Zayo. And so I always kind of gravitated towards that. And I just kind of made it part of my personality, like, oh, I'm going to hate country music, country music, stupid. I don't care about your tractor and your beer cans, and blah, blah. And that's kind of how it's gone. But for me now, you know, I just turned 37. My appetite for country music has grown considerably over the last five, six years or so. Um, a lot of it has to do because like, I've never liked radio country and I still don't like Florida, Georgia line, Luke Bryan, like, uh, Keith Urban. I, I just can't, I don't understand. I don't get it. I was like, I don't know how people can listen to this and be entertained. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm more into kind of like the outlaw country type thing or stuff that's got a, a little bit of a folk or bluegrass into it. I actually have, I'm just going to do stuff live on the show. I have an iTunes, um, playlist that I just named outlaw not everything on it is outlaw so on that playlist I've got some Chris Stapleton I've got some civil wars uh let's see what else turnpike troubadours uh trying to give a, a lot of bands shout outs here so let's kind of see um Shane Smith and the Saints uh Flatland Calvary the Steel Drivers uh Ian Munsick Tyler Childers uh Coulter Wall Robert Plant and Allison Krauss made some pretty great music as well um and, and there's more on here but like it's kind of been that style and then I've got you know some of my more popular things so I, I like Morgan Wallen and uh, Lady Antebellum before they turn themselves into Lady A I would enjoy and things like that so that's kind of my my history with country music so if you have great country music recommendations that are kind of more in the outlaw folk bluegrass side make sure you send me those recommendations but also i grew up in the south right so oklahoma is kind of weird because it's not really considered the south but it's not really the southwest and it's not really the midwest but if you say we're southerners or country like it just kind of makes sense it fits but when you grow up in the south and for those of you that have grown up in the south or in a country setting you're kind of marinated in christianese if you will you know, in at least in this culture of, you know, quote unquote, acting right. So there will be like biblical type things that are said. And some of the advice that comes from, you know, your granny and your papa, like they, you know, it, it kind of fits this Judeo-Christian ethic and it, whether it's, you know, them actually opening up the Bible and showing it to you. But that's basically what being in the South is. 
And it's like, you know, if you're from the South, and I don't mean this in like a, you know, American Civil War type thing, but if you're from the South, you don't like Northerners and you don't like those Yankees and all those weirdos out in California. Like, that's not really your thing. And that's just kind of this, you know, pride about being from the South. And, you know, Texas South is like its own thing because people in Texas think it's its own country, which to a degree it kind of is. But country music actually has a very long history of kind of working hand in glove with a lot of Christian-esque morality and living and, and biblical themes and language. And so I did a little bit of a dive on country music in and of itself. And the genre has been around for about 100 years because it was in the, when the 1920s when that be kind of it kind of became its own genre. And so I, I was kind of looking through lyrics for country music songs from popular country music artists from that time all the way through to today. And I found a lot of biblical material, a lot of kind of Christian-esque, Jesus-esque, God-esque type material. So I want to share some of that with you. So in the 1930s and 1940s, you had people like Gene Autry. So he has a song called Bible on the Table and a Flag Upon the Wall. And I'm going to read some of these lyrics. And I, I'll try not to sing them, but I'll, I'll just do my best. With the Bible on the table and the flag upon the wall, neighbors, that's the answer to it all. They're the backbone of the nation and will always find salvation with the Bible on the table and the flag on the wall. And then you had Hank Williams Sr. He had a song called uh, The Old Country Church. Here's a lyric from that. How I wish that today all the people would pray like we prayed in that old country church. If they'd only confess, Jesus surely would bless as he did in that old country church. And then we move on to another era, kind of the 50s and 60s. So we have a guy like Bill Munro. So he had a song called Crying Holy Unto the Lord. Here's a lyric. Crying holy unto the Lord, crying holy unto the Lord. Oh, if I could, if I could, I surely would stand on the rock where Moses stood. Then you have Elvis. So he recorded a lot of kind of gospel type music. He had a song called In the Garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear fall on my ear. The son of God discloses and then you get to the chorus and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as he we tarry there. None other has ever known. And then you've got the goat, Johnny Cash. He had a song very early in his career called He Turned Water Into Wine. It's very famous at this point that Johnny Cash tried to be a gospel artist at the beginning. And I think it was Sam Phillips at Sun Records was like, no, nah, man, I don't I don't really believe that you believe this stuff. And then he kind of got into his style. But in uh, He Turned Water Into wine, wine, he had this lyric. He turned the water into wine. He turned the water into wine. In the little Cana town, the word went all around that he turned the water into wine. Well, he walked upon the Sea of Galilee, he walked upon the Sea of Galilee, shouted far and wide, he calmed in the raging tide, and walked upon the Sea of Galilee. Then we get into the 70s and 80s, and so you have an artist like Dolly Parton. She recorded a, a song early in her career called Coat of Many Colors. As she sewed, she told a story from the Bible she had read about the coat of many colors Joseph wore, and then he said, Perhaps this coat will bring you good luck and happiness, and I just couldn't wait to hear, and Mama blessed it with a kiss. And then you've got Reba McIntyre, so she's from Oklahoma. She had a song called You Lift Me Up to Heaven. Because you lift me up, 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 up to heaven. When you gently lay me down, you lift me up, 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 up to heaven. Yes, you make my world go round. Now that's kind of more of like a relationship, you know, love song or whatever, but you still have kind of the imagery of heaven. Then we get into the 1990s and the 2000s. So this is kind of more the era that I grew up in. So I at least heard these songs when my parents would play them. So you had Randy Travis, he had a song called Three Wooden Crosses. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. I guess it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. Then you had Alabama. They had their mega hit, Angels Among Us, and so I'll read a lyric from that. Oh, I believe there are angels among us, sent down to us from somewhere up above. They come to you and me in our darkest hours to show us how to live, to teach us how to give, to guide us with the light of love. Then we have Josh Turner. The cool thing about Josh Turner, I actually played pool against him back in 2012, so that was fun. He had a song called Long Black Train on his first album, so here's a lyric. Because there's victory in the Lord, I say, victory in the Lord. Cling to the Father and his holy name, and don't go riding on that long black train. Then we get into the 2010s and 2020s where we are now. So I mentioned Morgan Wally, he, Morgan Wallen, rather. Uh, he, he's had several songs and he has several things and allusions to Christianity uh, throughout his music. But he had a song called Don't Think Jesus. So I'll read a lyric from that. If I was him, him talking about God, I'd say to hell with you. 
Ain't no helping you. Find someone else to give heaven to. I'm telling you. I'd shame me. I'd blame me. I'd make me pay for my mistakes. But I don't think Jesus does it that way. Then we've got one of the greatest modern artists, Chris Stapleton. He has a song called Drunkard's Prayer. I'll read from that. I wish that I could go to church, but I'm too ashamed of me. I hate the fact it takes a bottle to get me on my knees. And I hope he'll forgive the things you ain't forgot when I get drunk and talk to God. And then we've got Maddie and Tay. That's kind of like a a young poppy type country thing. They have a, a very beautiful song called Water in His Wine Glass. I'll read from that. Lord, pour water in his wine glass. Bring the man he used to be back. Because I want to look him in the eyes and he, and see someone I recognize. I'm on my knees and all I ask is, Lord, pour water in his wine glass. And then as I was preparing this episode, I was kind of scrolling through iTunes and I saw that Larry Fleet actually just released a new album and he has a song on it called Ain't Mad at Jesus. And I looked at the lyrics and they didn't disappoint, so I'll read these. She left me for all the right reasons. She left me a new King James and said to read it. And it looks like he's the only one that will forgive my sins. So I ain't mad at Jesus, even though she left me for him. And so the thing is, is country music, guys, for those of you that didn't grow up in the country or don't listen to country music, country music is kind of a cornerstone of country life. So there's, you know, listening to country music and working the land and tending to animals But then you also have going to church on Sundays and praying before meals and baptizing your kids. And those are all kind of staples and cornerstones of country life. But I noticed something a while back that, frankly, scared me. And there's a a lot of people that think, well, I'll put it this way. There are a lot of people that think they're going to heaven because they're from the South. Or, you know, because they listen to country music. Because they vote Republican, because they ain't never killed nobody, because, you know, they went to church with their granny when they were a kid and, you know, granny was a good Christian, right? And so I'm dubbing this philosophy and thought process, this phenomenon, if you will, as country music theology, okay? Now, to kind of elucidate my point a little bit further, there's actually another Morgan Wallen song that he released this year, which I think perfectly sums up this, the the tenets and the attitude behind music or behind country music theology. So the name of the song is in the Bible. So I want to read through the song a little bit here to kind of, you know, make my point a little bit more clear. Paint your truck tread with some red dust while you kick up the long way home. Share some bootleg with your best buds. Wear a bit of that bonfire smoke. If a back porch swing and twang in your words and setting that hook was a good book verse, I'd be doing all right. I'd know where I was going when I get to the other side cause Back roads and cold beer are my down-home prayer. Can't get no closer to the man upstairs. The way out there where the river runs, Lord knows I'd be one hell of a disciple. It being country was in the Bible. Hallelujah, amen, heaven blessed this life I live. Hallelujah, amen, amen. You kind of get the idea? It's... So it's like there's this dichotomy between what country music theology says and then what the actual Bible says, right? Because again, a lot of these country music stars or people that just grow up in the country, they grow up marinated in Christianese, but not really marinated in the scriptures, right? And then they just have this assumption that they're fine. Like I remember here recently, I went to a rodeo here in Oklahoma City. Tons of fun. If you haven't been to a rodeo, you need to go. But what I wasn't expecting to walk in there was to be in one of the hardest environments ever to, you know, watch what your eyes were seeing, right? Because I've gotten pretty good about bouncing my eyes. And so it's like, I only want to have eyes for my wife. I don't want to lust after any other women. But then I go to this rodeo and these chicks, these country chicks are not really leaving much to the imagination, right? Bare midriffs and, you know, plunging uh, necklines and short shorts and the whole nine yards. And I was like, what in God's name is happening here? Because I walked in with the assumption, hey, these are just good old down down home country people. And there were a lot of those people there. But then there were a bunch of hood rats that showed up, right? A bunch of skanky, uh, you know, women. And it made it hard. It made it very difficult for you to kind of uh, just operate and enjoy the show because of the show that was taking place in the stands. But again, you get this assumption, oh, they're, they're country, so it's fine. But it's maybe different uh, depending upon how you're raised. But anyway, country music theology says a lot, says lots of things. So they'll say country music theology says, Lord, I'm going to do me. But, you know, please bless me and keep me safe along the way. Whereas biblical theology says, 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's Ephesians 5.17. Country music theology says, the man upstairs. That's how they refer to God. Oh, it's in the man upstairs, right? Whereas biblical theology says, he is before all things. That's Colossians 1.17. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. That's Psalm 147.5. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Psalm 33.6. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's Psalm 34.8. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. And I could go on and on with these examples, but he's not the man upstairs. He's not the bro that lives in the attic. Like, he's before all things. He is love. He's all-powerful. And if you were in his presence, you wouldn't ask him a damn thing because you wouldn't even be able to look at him. And then, uh, you know, country music theology will say other things, and they say this through songs. So I mentioned Larry Fleet and Morgan Wall, and they actually did a song together called Where I Find God. So country music theology, according to Larry Fleet and Morgan Wall, is from a bar stool to that Evan Rood. Evan Rood's like a, you know, fishing boat engine. Sunday morning in a church pew, in a deer stand or a hayfield, an interstate back to Nashville, in a Chevrolet with the windows down, me and him just riding around. Sometimes whether I'm looking for him or not, that's where I find God. So that's what country music theology says, but biblical theology says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, because that, that lyric from Larry Fleet and Morgan Wallen, that's like, um, oh, you know, I'm just going to hang out with God as I'm driving around the truck or as I'm, you know, doing my hobbies, but that's not what the Bible would tell you to do. And then later on in that song, you know, they would say this, sometimes late at night, I lie there and listen to the sound of her heart beating and the song the crickets are singing. And I don't know what they're saying, but it sounds like a hymn to me. Now I ain't too good at praying, but thanks for everything, right? It's great when you sing it in a song, but that's what country music theology would say. But a biblical theology would say, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's 1 Thessalon- Thessalonians 5.18. So this kind of casual, yeah, yeah, I ain't too good at praying, but hey, thanks for everything. Like, that that's not how we're supposed to operate in the world. You see, with, with country music theology, we think God doesn't care what we choose to do. He's just going to bless us regardless of what we choose. You know, God is our buddy. He's our homeboy. You know, God's in nature, so there's no reason for me to worship corporately inside a church. And, you know, we should just casually thank him as we go throughout our day, but certainly not turn over our lives to him. Right. So I want to be abundantly clear about something as we wrap up this concept of the dangers of country music theology. Southerners don't go to heaven because they're from the South. Conservative Republicans don't go to heaven because they vote conservatively for Republican candidates. Country music fans don't go to heaven because they listen to country music. People don't go to heaven because their granny loved Jesus. God doesn't have grandchildren. And people that read the Bible and go to church don't go to heaven because they read the Bible and go to church. Okay? You know who goes to heaven? Those who put their faith in Christ for their salvation. That's who. goes back to the scripture I read from the very first part of this podcast, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So guys, this is my message really to anybody, and even more specifically to people that have been raised in the South. Maybe you're that person. You you grew up in the South. You, you ain't done much wrong. You did you know didn't you know fall into trouble with the law. Yeah, you, you didn't you know get a girl pregnant out of wedlock. You live a pretty good life. You 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 work hard. You listen to good music. You go to the uh, to church when you can. You throw some money you know in the plate as they pass it. And you know you're generally a good guy according to you. Well, according to God and according to Scripture, you're not a good guy because you're a sinner. And in order for you to have payment for your sins so that you can spend eternity with a just God who can't have sin in his presence, you have to have that sin paid for. And luckily, God, in his prominence and eminence, he sent his own son to this planet to be that payment. You know, they used to have to sacrifice animals. God became that animal through Jesus. He became the lamb of God that was sacrificed so that if you will just confess 
that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you can have salvation. Okay. And so for some of you, it's, it's clicking now, right? we use whatever theological language you want to use. But for some of you, it just clicked that you've been trying to live a good life. You've been trying to, you know, check the, I'm a good dude boxes, trying to live a generally moral life, but you didn't have Jesus and you can have him. So I'm imploring you right now to take that step of faith and make that decision to believe in your heart that, that God, when he sent his son down here, that that somehow counted for you. When he was killed on the cross and when he was resurrected the third day, somehow you were in that story as well. The Bible is not about you, but it certainly is for you. And so for any of you guys, if you are accepting Christ for the first time, there's not any magic that's in some prayer. There's not, you know, this, you know, incantation that you have to say out loud. There's not these ohms that you have to give or whatever those things are. You can start living a new life right now. Okay. And if you need help doing that, Info at undaunted.life. Hit us up. We'll get you some resources. We'll get you a Bible in your hand. We'll try to help you find a good expository preaching church, you know, some discipleship, those types of things. So if you're making that decision for the first time, please, please, please share that information with us. All right. At long last, let's get into these quick hitters. So first one here, former President Donald Trump's arrest and mugshot. So this is according to the AP. And this is a really dramatic article by the AP, but I wanted to read it because it was so ridiculous. A camera clicks in a fraction of a second. The shutter opens and then closes, freezing forever, the image in front of it. And when the camera shutter blinked inside of the Atlanta jail on Thursday, this was a couple weeks ago, it both created and documented a tiny inflection point in American life. Captured for posterity, there was a former president of the United States for the first time in history under arrest, captured in the sort of frame more commonly associated with drug dealers or drunken drivers. The trappings of power gone for that split second. Left behind an enduring image that will appear in history books long after Donald Trump is gone. And I feel like they they really enjoyed every single word of that that they wrote. But this booking in Georgia is currently one of four current criminal indictments against the former president. The other three are in Washington, D.C., Florida, and New York. And each of those precincts are attempting to do trials, you know, before the general election next year. I think one of them starts like the day before Super Tuesday or something like that. So there's certainly a political angle to this because these charges could have been brought and filed and, you know, trials could have occurred, you know, year, you know a year ago or so, but they're doing it now. It seems pretty intentional. But automatically and immediately... This mugshot became the most famous mugshot in history. So more than O.J. Simpson, more than Michael Jackson, more than Al Capone, more than Pablo Escobar, more than Sinatra, even more than Martin Luther King Jr. Like it it is the most famous mugshot ever. There's already been millions and millions of dollars made off of T-shirts sold with this. And the thing is, is like they didn't even need to do a mugshot. Do you know why they do a mugshot? Because I didn't really know this until all this was going down. They They're doing it because they need to know what you look like in case you try to flee the jurisdiction or flee the the state or the country or something like that. Donald Trump is probably right now the most recognizable person on planet Earth. It's probably like him, Lionel Messi and Taylor Swift. I think like those might be the most famous uh, recognizable people on the planet. Those people can't go anywhere. They're not going to sneak onto or off of a plane. They're doing this to try to humiliate Trump, which I think he's actually incapable of being humiliated just because of how he's wired, but that's why they're doing this. And the interesting thing about this mugshot is both sides are using the mugshot to their own ends. So people on the left are like, we finally got him and look at this mugshot. Look how mad he looks. And they're so excited, you know, as they, you know, drink their frothy drinks and their, you know, uh, avocado toast and all that stuff. And then you have people on the right that think this is the greatest thing ever. Like, oh, look how strong he looks. And, you know, he's not going to be denied and we're just going to embrace it. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But I'm going to get right to my big takeaway here on this story. All this hubbub pretty much ensures that Donald Trump wins the Republican nomination, which also pretty much ensures that Biden or whichever Democrat is actually representing the party by that time wins the White House. Because Trump right now, he's lapping the Republican challengers. You know, I'm very disappointed in the uh, DeSantis campaign, not in DeSantis. DeSantis himself is a tremendous governor, and the job of president is governor of the entire country. That's essentially what you're doing. I think he's the most qualified. I think he has the easiest chance of beating Joe Biden or whoever's representing the Democratic Party at that time. But the the campaign has kind of lagged. I feel like his campaign people are trying to get him to be something that he's not. It's like, let him just be, you know, a guy that doesn't have this overwhelming personality. Let him just be a guy that 
knows how to get things done. But Trump is up on him like 35 points in, you know, almost every poll, 35 points or more. It looks like he's going to run away with this thing. There's a lot of time left, but it looks like he's going to run away with it. But I have a couple of categories of questions for people that, you know, get mad every time I talk about Trump and they think I hate on him. Because, again, guys, I voted for him in 2020. If he's the nominee again this uh, this next year, this next go around, I would likely vote for him. But I have questions for Trump supporters in general. And then I have questions for, you know, kind of the ardent Trump supporters that think the 2020 election was stolen. So for the ardent Trump supporters in general, how many votes does your vote count for? Because. Being super duper dedicated and supporting of Trump changes nothing. Your vote still counts for one vote. So the fact that you are more excited to vote for him in, you know, 2024 than you were in 2020 or 2016 doesn't actually make a difference. Another question for you guys is how will Trump win over independents, Democrats and Republicans that didn't vote for him in 2020? Like, what exactly is his plan? Because I pay attention to the things that Trump says, but when he, you know, puts things out on True Social or when he talks in the media, what plan is he laying out for you on how he's going to win over just even just independence and suburban women? Because independence and suburban women broke two to one for Biden this go round, and that cost Trump the election, as far as we know, right? So what's his plan exactly? Also, don't you think that you should at least give some consideration to the fact that Democrats are desperately trying to make sure that Donald Trump is the Republican nominee for president. You can tell by how much they're elevating Trump and trying to knock out DeSantis, who is really the only contender, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy and, you know, uh, Nikki Haley and all that, like they're, they're not going to overtake Trump. DeSantis is the only one that's even there. They're desperately trying to do that. Now the media, which are our Democrats, uh, they obviously need Donald Trump as a foil for Joe Biden so that they can, you know, make money and have ratings. But they also want a candidate that they know is easy for their guy to beat, which regardless of what you think or say, Donald Trump is clearly an easy candidate for Joe Biden to beat. He's already done it before. And the last question just for people that are just ardent Trump supporters is, do you realize that you can believe Trump is being targeted for political reasons and that he's not the best candidate to beat Biden in 2024? Like, when did we lose this ability to hold things in tension, to, to believe two things at the same time? Because I, I believe that Donald Trump is being targeted for political reasons. I think it's, it's clear as day. Now, his Florida case, you know, he was on tape basically talking about breaking the law. Like, that's, that's egregious. But I, I can say that most of these things are for political reasons. These people are trying to get a political feather in their hat and become historical. But at the same time, I don't think he's the best person to be Biden. Like, at all. Like, I think there are several Republican candidates that could beat Biden heads up very easily because Biden now, like, he's not going to have to debate Trump, right? Because, you know, Trump's an insurrectionist and, you know, Trump didn't even go to his own debates for his own party. So I'm not going to debate him. But if anybody else were the Republican candidate, Trump or Biden would have to debate them. Right. And could you see Ron DeSantis like or Vivek Ramaswamy or Nikki Haley or even Tim Scott against a debate against Joe Biden? It would be a bloodbath. But now I want to shift to questions for the ardent Trump supporters that think the 2020 election was literally stolen. First question. How do you know that? How do you know that? Because I want to remind you that Donald Trump and his lawyers did not allege in official court filings anywhere near what they alleged behind a podium at a news conference. So, you know, you'll watch these documentaries and you'll see the things that are put out in True Social. But then when you get to the court filings, it's like, wait a minute, they didn't actually, you know, say the same things. So I don't even think Donald Trump believes what he's been saying, but he's still saying it. Also, how has Donald Trump proven to you that the election won't be stolen from him again in 2024? Like, what exactly has he done to prove to you that the outcome will be different this time? Because Donald Trump already lost to the corpse of Joe Biden once already. We saw that. Joe Biden is still dead, but Trump is still Trump. Now he has the disadvantage of not being the incumbent. Like, what exactly is Donald Trump going to do as a private citizen now to ensure that there's going to be election integrity? Like, I remember, you know, someone sent me a message. They're like, yeah, well, Donald Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy are the only two that really care about election integrity. That's not true at all. I think every Republican candidate that's running cares about election integrity, but like, what can they do to affect it is the real question. What can they do to ensure that it is safe and that it is secure? And the last question I have, and we'll wrap up this point with this is, isn't getting Joe Biden out of the white house more important than Donald Trump's personal ego 
and getting some sort of vindication. Because, you know, if you really, really love Trump, he should set up a defense fund and you should fund that. But when you give money to Donald Trump right now, you are funding his legal battles. You're not funding his ability to create, you know, legislation if he gets into office. You're literally paying for a billionaire's bills that are going to be coming from his own hand-selected legal team. I don't quite understand that. And so there's so much more to be done here. Obviously, there's a lot of time left here, but, you know, it's going to be a circus the whole way. So buckle up. All right, next one here. Dennis Prager's claim that one form of child pornography is morally acceptable. So I want to play this clip from Dennis Prager's interview when he was on Pints with Aquinas with Matt, I think it's Frad is how you say his last name, F-R-A-D-D. So let me play this uh, two-minute clip for you here. Suppose a man says, I view animated child porn. So there's no real victim in that sense right. of child pornography, which we both agree is horrendous. And by viewing animated child porn, it prevents me from acting out sexually on a child. Now, I, I deny that. I think that pornography inflames us to then want to act those fantasies out. And I think there's good studies that back that up. But surely you wouldn't say to the man who views animated child pornography, that's not bad so long as you don't act it out. Wouldn't you want to help this poor sick dude? Yes, I would, but I'm thrilled that he's not acting it out. I mean, Agreed. Okay. Of course. Well, that's big. Yeah. We're both thrilled <laughs> that he might have a poor substitute, but it is a substitute if that were the case. No child is being used. Yeah. It's all animated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and he. Uh, but would you would you use the word evil of animated child pornography? Because no, I, I certainly can't, I, would. I can't, no, I would use evil only with behavior. That's where we might differ. Yeah. F- forgetting the sex issue, you can't be evil. You didn't do evil if you thought evil. You y- did y- evil if I'm if masturbating you committed... to animated pictures of pornography. I'm not doing something evil. That's correct. Yeah, I think that's I think that's despicable. Yeah. Really? Yes, of course. Who is being hurt? You have to have a victim. Oh, I'll tell you. There's at least two people being hurt. There's the person who's poisoning himself by yes, encouraging yes, him to right. think I acting want, out on okay. children. And there's also so the animator. Okay, wait a minute. We both we both are aching for him not to have those fantasies. I agree with you, but I... But I, you won't call it evil. I, I won't call a fantasy evil. So there's a lot there. And just full disclosure, I'm a huge fan of Dennis Prager and Prager, you and the stuff that they've done. But this is this is terrible. The the stuff that that he said here. So let's go through a few of the quotes that Dennis Prager had. One quote, I would use evil only with behavior. So he would only describe things as evil if they are behavior. So Dennis Prager doesn't think that masturbating while watching images of children being forcibly penetrated by adults is evil. He doesn't think that that is evil. Now, Dennis Prager is an Orthodox Jew, um, or I think, you know, he's Jewish of some kind, but I think he's Orthodox. But this is a guy that takes his, uh, he takes Judaism, Judaism seriously, but then we could even see in this interaction the differences that we find when you look at a, you know, ethic that comes from Judaism only versus an ethic that has more of a Judeo-Christian type of a worldview and tinge to it. So another quote he had is, you didn't do evil if you thought evil. So, The thing is, though, is if you're a Christian, in light of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that is exactly wrong. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, (laughs) like how I went, here's a song or a a podcast about country music, and I'm like, Sermon on the Mount. All right, so it happens. It happens. The twain comes out. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about hate and how if you hate someone, you've basically murdered them. He talks about lust, that if you've lusted after somebody, you've committed adultery already. So Yes, in the Christian worldview, if you think evil, you have done evil. There's no way to hide from that. And then the last quote I'll go through from Dennis Prager is, who is being hurt? You have to have a victim. And I thought the host did a great job with this interaction, but he said there absolutely are victims. But here's my list of who the victims are, the people that are being hurt, that are viewing AI-generated child porn. So first, the person that's using the porn as a masturbatory aid, right? As the, as the guy you know pointed out, they're, they're literally poisoning themselves. That person is a victim. The other victims, all the people around the person that is using that kind of porn. Do you think that if you are masturbating to try to climax to images of these children being violently raped, whether they're AI or not, that that's not going to have an impact on the people around you? You're a fool if you believe that. Other victims, but the potentially the living children that this person would eventually try out their fantasies on. 
when you listen to these these stories or these interviews with serial killers, you know, a lot of these people had the exact same track to killing people, right? They started by looking at pornography, then they started fantasizing about violent sex and, you know, hurting living beings, then they started hurting animals, then they started hurting people, then they started raping people, murdering people, raping dead corpses, those types of things. It kind of follows the same track. And the thing with pornography is, and we saw this in the book, How Pornography Harms by John Fobert, is you get to a point where your body's not going to release the same amount of dopamine. And so you're going to keep chasing that higher dosage. That's why people will start looking at still images of naked women, and they'll eventually find themselves looking at rape porn, murder porn, child porn, like those types of categories, because their fantasies and you know what they're watching isn't really satisfying them anymore. And then you see a lot of people that turn their fantasies, you know, sitting in front of a laptop with their pants around around their ankles, they turn that to the real world. And so to think that you have the, all these people that are watching and masturbating to AI generated child porn, that they're not going to actually try that on a child. Again, it's absolutely foolish. And another victim I thought of is AI doesn't create itself it has to be programmed at least for now. So another victim is the AI, the AI programmer that had to give these inputs to the AI to even create the imagery that you're needing to use as your masturbatory aid. So there are a lot of victims here. So my big takeaway on this story is that this is an egregious take, like an absolutely egregious take by Dennis Prager, but I don't want people to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I completely disagree with Dennis Prager on this. I disagree with his thoughts on porn. He thinks porn is no big deal. He thinks porn could even help a marriage. I think he's super duper wrong on that, but he's right about a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. He's wrong on his thoughts about Jesus, but he knows a lot about the Torah and so that's my one caution here is I think, again, we should be able to hold things in tension, be able to say two things at once, claim two things at once. You can be a fan of Dennis Prager and like what he's done, especially for conservatism, but think that, you know, he holds some egregious opinions. And this is certainly one of those. All right, next quick hitter here, the resurgence of COVID and mask mandates. So this is according to CNN. If you're at high risk of serious illness or death from COVID-19, it's time to dust off those N19 masks and place them snugly over your nose and mouth and protect yourself from a recent uptick of the virus, according to a growing number of experts. A new variant, BA.2.86, doesn't sound that scary, but, you know, has captured scientists' attention because it's highly mutated. But so far, it's only been detected in a small number of people globally. Nonetheless, it doesn't look good in terms of the virus's nonstop evolution. The virus keeps finding new ways to challenge humans to find new hosts and repeat hosts, and it's relentless. Okay, so are you scared yet? Here's the big takeaway on this one. You can kiss every last square inch of my Irish took us. You're not going to get me to care about this unless it starts killing children at a rate of like, you know, seven out of 10 or something like that. You're not going to get me to care. I don't care about the Joe Biden's poll numbers are too low variant. I don't want to hear anything from Russell Moore or any people like him that talk about the, the Bible says we're supposed to love our neighbor though variants. I don't care. And here's the thing that I want to encourage enough people here. Let's say you live in a place where they're going to try to enforce a mask mandate at your school or, you know, at different businesses that you would shop at or, you know, with TSA, with the, the airports and things like that. If enough people don't comply, they can't force this down your throats. So let's use the airport as an example. So let's say today. They announced that, hey, tomorrow we're starting mask mandates. If you're in an airport, if you're on an airplane, you have to wear a mask or you can't fly. Okay? So take any airport, right? So you're at DFW down there in Dallas. You're in the airport. There's literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people running around down there. If half of y'all said, no, I'm not wearing a mask, not doing it, and you you go to the security line and the guy says, sorry, we can't let you through security. You don't have your mask on. Say, so, yeah, it's too bad. I bought a ticket. You can't stop me. And the next person does that. And the next person does that. And the person that's thinking, you know, the TSA agent that's thinking about stopping the first person, they look in line and they see 200 other people without masks on. Do you think we're going to shut down air travel in this country entirely? We're going to shut down the entire industry. We're going to disrupt travel across this country because they want us to wear masks again for something that is essentially endemic and a cold for most people. I'm sorry. That is my encouragement to you. We haven't gotten there yet. We'll see how things go. They're going to try something like this again. You have to not comply. 
Because the more you comply and the more you just go along to get along, the worse it's going to be for everybody in the long run. I think we saw that in 2020 and the subsequent years for sure. All right, next quick hitter here. The recent racially motivated shooting in Jacksonville, Florida. So this is according to the Washington Examiner. Multiple people were killed during a mass shooting in Jacksonville, Florida on Saturday, August the 26th in what officials said was a racially motivated attack. Shooter Ryan Palmeter, 21 years old, opened fire at a Dollar General store on Saturday, killing three black people. The victims have been named as Angela Michelle Carr, 52, store employee, A.J. Laguerre, 19, and Gerald Gallion, 29. Palmeter killed himself as police arrived. Palmeter used legally purchased weapons, an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle with swastika emblems and a Glock handgun, despite having a past in having a past involuntarily committed for a mental health exam in 2017. However, because he was released following the examination, it would not have appeared on background checks according to authorities. The sheriff said Palmeter left behind racist writings in which he expressed white supremacist views and used racial slurs. Waters said that Palmeter hated black people and described his manifesto as a diary of a madman. The Justice Department has opened a federal hate crime investigation into the shooting, Attorney General Merrick Garland said. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida has condemned the actions of Palmeter, calling him a major league scumbag. So my big takeaway on this one, I don't necessarily want to talk about this individual story. OK, because he purchases guns legally. So people will talk about the guns here. But again, I've talked about that at nauseam. There's not a law in the books that currently would have stopped that from happening. This wasn't a guy, you know, this is a guy that, you know, fell through the cracks in a lot of different ways, but it not, wasn't necessarily at the gun store when he went to go pick up his firearm. There's a lot of different things you could talk about here, but I want to take a slightly different angle. Why do we automatically know without any shadow of a doubt, mind you, what the motivation of this shooter in Jacksonville was? But we still, to this day, do not know what motivated the so-called trans person that murdered six people, including three nine-year-olds at Covenant Christian School in Nashville. How do we have no motivation there? You know, that, that piece of human debris had a manifesto. Why haven't we seen it? Because we haven't seen the manifesto of this Jacksonville shooter yet, but we know what's in it because the authorities just straight out told us. Yeah, it had a bunch of racist writings, a bunch of racial slurs, and the firearm that was used in the attack had swastikas on it. Seems like, you know, it's, it's white supremacy, right? And that, you know, feeds the leftist narrative that white supremacy, is, it, white supremacy is the biggest threat we face when it's not global warming or something like that, climate change. But in this type of aspect, we have six people killed at a Christian school, and it looks like it was out of anti-Christian hate, but there was no federal hate crime investigation opened up. There are parents from Nashville who are, you know, still mourning the deaths of their children that want the manifesto to be released. And they're just like, you know, because here's the thing. So some people are like, well, you know, I've changed my mind on the manifesto because the manifesto had, you know, the writings that were, you know, uh, basically giving it would give ammunition, you know, forgive the pun to people that would want to do things like this in the in the future. And so we don't want to give people that ammunition. We want to try to protect future kids. You can release a redacted version where it doesn't give like, hey, here's exactly how I planned out my attack, but you can still get the motivation. And so that, again, there's favoritism in law enforcement and in the media industrial complex, if you will, to make sure that they elevate, they elevate stories that are useful to them. So a white guy, that's a white supremacist killing black people. That's that's about as useful a story as the ma the mainstream media can have because it fits all their narratives and checks all their boxes. But when a white person that thinks that they're trans, which you know fits the leftist narrative that you know that transing is even a thing, being trans is a thing. When they go and kill Christians, it's like, oh well, I guess there's no there there. Oh, it's it's an absolute mystery. It's a mystery. How, you know, what, what could have possibly motivated this person? Oh, they left behind the reason why they did it? Ah, we probably can't let anybody know that. And you can see because if you go back to that, you know, situation with Covenant Christian School in Nashville, the police chief came out and said, yeah, we're, we're about to, we're going to release this thing and we're going to get it to everybody. And then within a few days, you, you didn't hear a word about it. You didn't hear a word about the motivations or the manifesto anymore. I think that's something to keep an eye on as we see future stories because unfortunately, things like this will continue to happen. All right, last quick hitter of the day, the passing of the great Bob Barker. So this is according to ABC News. Legendary TV star Bob Barker, who hosted the famed game show The Price is Right for 35 years, has died. He was 99. 
Barker died in his home on Saturday, August the 26th. His longtime publicist, Roger Neal, told ABC News he had he was a few months shy of his 100th birthday. Barker won 19 Daytime Emmy Awards, including 14 for Outstanding Game Show Host, as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Daytime Emmys in 1995. His wife died in 1981 of lung cancer. He never remarried. I never had any inclination to remarry. She was my wife, he said. So I think there's something very uh, beautiful about that quote about him and his wife and not getting remarried. So Bob Barker hosted The Price is Right from 1972 to 2007. So again, as that said, 35 years, thousands and thousands of episodes. And I have the same, you know, I guess, (laughs) friendship with Bob Barker as most of you had. I got to watch Bob Barker when I was sick from school. When I was staying home sick from school, because what the what a you know prices right came on at like nine or ten o'clock in the morning central time, and so I'd be sick, and that was the one thing I could look forward to. So if I had you know if I was throwing up or had diarrhea or a fever, I knew for an hour that I could be entertained by all these crazy people, you know, guessing prices of you know boxes of you know oatmeal or trying to win a car, any of those types of things. It was an um. It was a pleasure, really, to to be able to watch those shows, and you could kind of disconnect from a little bit, and you could kind of live vicariously through these people and their excitement, and Bob Barker just seemed like a really, really nice guy, and from all the things that you've seen about him outside of the show, it seems like he was really a stand-up guy. So my big takeaway on this one, as I'm sure most of you have heard others say by now, he got as close to 100 without going over. R.I.P. Bob, thank you for the memories, and that'll do it for today's show. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So a reminder to any of you guys that need help with your tech at your businesses, don't do the IT stuff by yourself. Do, you know, get the experts in there. Like, don't be the guy that does it by yourself and messes it all up. So again, go to getsecurity.tech to have my friends at LMS Tech help you out. That's getsecurity.tech. And again, as you always know, we're affiliated with origin all that stuff's on our website as well in terms of the show notes today i've got a donation link i've got a link to the old episodes i've got a link to the tim tebow foundation that i talked about in this episode a link to our shop where you can buy the cigars and then everything we talked about with the you know country music theology and all the quick hitters all that is right there in the show the show notes for you guys so enjoy it it's right there Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song, Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.